Hello students, welcome to ITTV's lesson on biology. You will be joining me for biology form 4 and we'll be on with chapter 2 now. And as you have already seen from your earlier lesson, you already know what biology is more or less about. And today we will be studying to learn and getting deeper into the world of biology because our first lesson now would be on cells, on the cells and their structures. So students, today's lesson will be on cell structure and functions, right? Yeah. So where did you learn about cells before this? Yeah, when you were in PMR, back when you were in Form 1, that was like many years back, you have already learned that cell is a basic unit of life. Now back at that time, you were also wondering, how could the cell be a basic unit of life? What, what is this meaning of basic unit of life? That means, it is the smallest unit in every living thing. Which also means that we are made up completely of cells. Now take for an example, a brick wall for instance. Can this brick wall be broken down? Yeah, of course it can. And if you break down this wall, you will end up getting bricks. Can you break down the bricks further? Of course, if we break it down, we will get stones. The stones can be further broken down into grains of sands. Now the grains of sands cannot be further broken down because they are the smallest unit. So long story short, in order to make an entire brick wall, I will need to have millions, maybe billions or trillions of grains of sands all joined together carrying out a certain function. True? That is the life of a cell. A cell will get together to form tissues, organs, systems and eventually the organism. Examples of organisms are like both you and me, the plants out there, the animals out there and all lots of other forms of living things that can be found on the face of the earth. What about microorganisms? Are they made up of cells also? Obviously, all living things has got to be made up of cells. The difference here is, we are more complex and in order to carry out a more complex activity, we will have to have a great variant of cells. So we are called multicellular organisms. However, unicellular organisms also exist. Uni referring to comprising of one cell only. Those are examples of amoeba and paramecium that you already have seen back in your PMR days. So, boys and girls, this is the first lesson of true biology because before this, all you did was you were introduced to what biology can do or if I learn biology, where would I go and work? What are the kinds of things that I can do if I learn biology? Now, today onwards, what will happen is you'll be taken onto a great wonderful ride and that ride is known as the biology world. And together, we will get into detail of each and every form of biochemical reaction that exists, each and every type of mechanisms that are found and the beauty of the human body and other organisms as well. Now, all remember, throughout our lesson, in Form 4 and Form 5, you will have to remember one thing close to your heart. Always keep an open mind of everything that you learn. Don't stress yourself out. Don't make it very exam oriented. Don't say that I will have to learn this for the sake of doing my exams. No, biology is more beautiful than that. That's why I love it. Because there is more to it than what meets the eye. If you can understand and grasp the things that go on around you, it will be so beautiful, it will blow your mind away. Now, the whole story of this cell thing started long, long, long time ago. There was a little English gentleman. His name was Mr. Robert Hooke. Now, most of you would have heard Robert Hooke's name, right? Yeah, he was the guy who found the cell itself. Yeah, and Robert Hooke was gifted in a, in a kind of way because during his time, there was another gentleman named Anton von Leeuwenhoek, right? Now, this man, he created the microscope itself. He designed a microscope by placing two lenses on different levels. You will learn all of this in physics. And then he managed to pass light through this microscope and allow a magnification of some sort to occur. Therefore, Robert Hooke could use Anton von Leeuwenhoek's microscope in order to view the cell and what is inside the cell. Now see, he came up with the term cell because in a prison, the smallest unit would be a cell. You know the place where the prisoner stays? Yeah. So he took that term and he coined it for here. 
and ever since then the term stuck and we today call it as the cell. So to make the long story short, let's say you have a living organism and inside this living organism there are millions of little rooms found around. Those little rooms are called as the cell. So we are made up of billions and billions of cells. True? Wonderful. Now, what was this microscope about? I'll take you on a brief description on the microscope itself so that you'll be able to familiarize with the situation. Let's take a look. Now, as you can see, there are two forms of microscope, a light microscope and an electron microscope. The primitive version, the primitive means the older version was the light microscope. There was always a light microscope and recently science came up with a better way to magnify objects and we found the electron microscope. Let's take a look at the light microscope because you'll be using them in your labs soon enough. A light microscope has got few structures that require your attention. Now, first and foremost, can you look at the arm? The arm is a very important part of your handling because you will always have to hold the microscope on the arm. The arm is a very important part of the microscope because for you to handle the microscope you got to be very careful as it is not cheap. So always place one hand on the arm and the other on the bottom so that you prevent it from falling and breaking. Next, the most important parts of the microscope now would be on the top, the ocular lens also known as the eyepiece. Now this is where you place your eye and you will be able to view on the inside and at the bottom of that ocular lens you will find three objective lens. Can you see three objective lens? Good. One is smaller, one is a little longer and the third is the longest. So the degree of magnification will increase. For example, there are different types of microscope. Some microscopes will have the smaller lens will give you a four times magnification. The bigger lens will give you an eight times magnification or a 16 times magnification. And the largest will give you sometimes up to 64 times magnification. So it depends on how deep or how much you want to magnify an object to see it. If you want a big magnification, once again, which lens would you use? Yes, you will use the most powerful and the longest objective lens. Carry on. And then you can also see there is a stage there. The stage is where you would place your specimen. And the moment you place your specimen, you will have to clip them using those stage clips so that they don't move around. Then there are another two parts that you will have to be familiar to handle with. First, the coarse adjustment knob. And finally, the fine adjustment knob. Students, which one will we have to adjust first? The coarse or the fine? Obviously, the cause first because it will give you a great degree of movement. The fine tuning will allow you to specifically locate a certain location in the cell itself. Next, you can see there's a diaphragm there. The diaphragm will allow light to enter. So once you get yourself into a lab, you will see that the diaphragm consists of different sizes of holes. The larger size of hole will allow more light to come into the microscope, allowing a brighter view. But if you just want to see a dimmer view, all you can do is shift the diaphragm around to have a smaller loop. Next, you can see that nowadays we will have a light source attached to it. Back in those days, the first microscopes required sunlight. So if I would wanted to do my work at night, I probably could not use it. So, today's micro light microscope is even more better. Why? Because we have a battery operated or an electrical operated light tube, which will always give you a supply of light. Okay, now, if we already had a light microscope, why do I need an electron microscope? Dear students, for that, let's have a basic drawing. Students, when you were in PMR days, Remember how you drew the cell? It was very easy, wasn't it? A cell was simply drawn like this. Put a circle, put a dark area on one corner, and dots everywhere else. Correct? This was the cell membrane, cytoplasm, nucleus. True? We only had three basic labels in a cell. But today, you're grown-ups, you're getting deeper into the worlds of cells. 
Now, a light microscope can easily prove to you the existence of a cell membrane, cytoplasm, and the nucleus itself. But then, in a cell, there are more organelles compared to this. These are not the only three. In fact, you will see that there are more than five in later on. So, in order for me to view structures such as the mitochondria, structures such as the chloroplast, Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum, lysosomes, whoa, there are so many, aren't they? In order to view all of them, you will have to have a more powerful microscope, which will be powered by electrons. Yeah. An electron microscope can zoom in to get the size of an electron. Ooh, that's how powerful it is, isn't it? So, now you know why we have more than one microscope. So students, since you have a brief view about what the microscope can do and how I can view a cell, let's see what Robert Hooke saw. Alright? Now, let's take a look at the structure of the animal cell first. Now, let's move on a clockwise rotation. We will start with the plasma membrane. This is also known as a cell membrane. So, when you and PMR, cell membrane was a term, now we are calling it plasma membrane. Now, the plasma membrane is a very important part of the cell. Why? Because it controls the movement of substances in and out of the cell. Very good. You remember that from PMR. Now, how does it do that? You will learn as a separate chapter in the next chapter, chapter 3. So, you see, the organelles are beautiful because each one of them has got a specific function. And in SPM, they will always target for you to know the shape, structure, and the function. Shape, structure, function. Always remember that, okay? So you will also have to keep thinking in your mind, what does it do? And once you know what does it do, you will also be able to understand yourself. If this organelle is not functioning, if this organelle is missing, what will happen to the cell? Okay? So always keep that in mind and we'll do it together. Okay, let's take a look. Now, the plasma membrane controls substances movement in and out of the cell. Next, you have a cytoplasm. Now, the cytoplasm is a jelly-like substance which suspends all the other organelles which are found in them. Okay, next, you can find a nucleolus, nuclear membrane, nuclear pore, and chromatins found inside the nucleus. Wow, look at that. When you were in PMR, all you knew was a bunch of scribblings and they were known as the nucleus. But now the nucleus itself has a membrane and that membrane has got pores in them. Why is there a pore in them? Keep this question in your mind. Somewhere around Form 4, you will get to know the answers and then you will always realize, oh my goodness, that was the reason why. Okay? That's what makes biology most interesting. Okay? Next. You can see the words chromatin there, right? Now, that is the most important part of the nucleus because it carries genetic information in the form of DNA. Next, surrounding that nucleus or almost immediately after the nucleus, you can find something called the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, pay attention to the drawing. You can see that there are two parts of the endoplasmic reticulum. One is a rough and the other is a smooth. Now, because we always find it difficult to say the whole word, rough, endoplasmic reticulum, smooth, endoplasmic reticulum. <sighs> see, you get tired, don't you? So sometimes, in sake of notes, we will always write them as R-E-R -E or S-E-R. So you should be able to understand that it is rough endoplasmic and smooth endoplasmic. But remember, never at all in your exams use the short terms as in R-E-R -E or S-E-R. Okay? You will always have to write in your exams incomplete. But if you're learning in school or you're doing your own notes or you see somebody telling it to you, they will usually use a shorter version of it. Remember that in your mind. Next, let's take a look at something called the centrioles. Now the centriole looks like a little T, doesn't it? Okay. Now the centrioles are actually fibers and these fibers help the cell to carry out cell division. So you see, there is something known as cell division. What is cell division? We have a little cell and that cell will have to divide into two cells and they will grow. And then each cell will have to divide again and they will grow. That is how cells multiply. So in order for that process to happen in an animal cell, you need centrioles. Next, you can also see glycogen there. Now what is glycogen? Glycogen is actually a food storage in animal cell. 
it comes from glucose. Then you can see another organelle there called the lysosome. Now inside the lysosome, you can find little drops of lysozymes in them. Why do they sound the same? The name of the organelle is lysosome. Inside the lysosome, there are enzymes. That enzymes help the cell to do digestion. Hey, remember, you were always saying, cell is the basic unit of life. So if there is an individual human being, I can survive on my own, can't I? In the same way, a cell is also an individual which can survive on its own. So, if I can eat and I can digest my food and I can excrete my food away, the same thing the cell can also carry out. It can also gain nutrients such as glucose, amino acids, water, mineral salts, vitamins. It can absorb all of this and it can digest them, break them down, create something new for itself and it can also excrete. So in order to digest, we have a digestive system. What about the cell? It's a single cell. It can't have a system inside it, can it? So it needs these enzymes to help it to digest. Come, once again, let's see. Lysosomes contain enzymes. So to order, in order for you to call out the name of the enzyme, you will say lysosome enzymes. Lysosome enzymes, tiring. Might as well put it together. Lysozymes, get it? Good, next. Now, the most important of all the organelles, boys and girls, is this mitochondria. Take a good look at it. Now, watch all the other organelles that are around there. Look at the mitochondria. It has two lines. One oval in shape, and you can find another one on the inside. Can you see? It zigzags. It zigzags. Can you see that? Good. Now, always remember this. The mitochondria and the nucleus are the two organelles in an animal cell that have two membranes. In a plant cell, we will have another fella. He is called as the chloroplast. The chloroplast will also have two membranes. Can you name the three organelles that have two membranes? The answers are mitochondria, chloroplast and nucleus. Okay, good. Next. The mitochondria is important to produce energy in the form of ATP. We will see in a while how. Then you can find vesicles. You can also find a Golgi apparatus there. Now the function of the Golgi apparatus is to modify and it is involved in the synthesis of protein. Vesicles, vesicles. What are these vesicles? Remember when you were young, if people asked you the difference between an animal cell and a plant cell, 95% of the students will tell me that a plant cell has vacuole, animal cells no vacuole. End of story. No. Always remember, that's not how it is now. A plant cell and an animal cell both has these empty spaces that's filled with liquid. Now, in an animal cell, we call it vesicles because they are small, but they are numerous. There are many of them. In a plant cell, however, there is one large central vacuole. And that's why we call it vacuole instead of vesicle. Get it? So the vacuole and the vesicle, the function more or less the same. They store something in it. Okay? Remember that? Let's carry on to the functions of each one of them. Let's take a look at a plant cell now. In a plant cell, you can find a structure called chloroplast, right? Now still remember what I was telling you a while ago? The chloroplast has two membranes. Can you see them? Very good. Okay. The chloroplast also has a large central vacuole. Can you see that now? Good. Pay attention to the word tonoplast. Oh sir, come on sir. Why is there so many new words? I know, I know, I know it's hard for now. But don't worry, it will all come into place as the chapters go by. Don't worry anything about how much you're learning now because you will keep repeating these words again and again and again throughout these next two years, okay? So, we have a cell and we have a plasma membrane that covers the cell, right? So in that same way, we have a vacuole and we'll have something to cover the vacuole as well. That is known as the tonoplast. So what is the tonoplast? The tonoplast is actually a form of membrane. Don't use the term cell membrane because it doesn't cover the cell. It covers the vacuole. Call it the tonoplast. Once again, tonoplast. Good. And finally, let's take a look at the cell wall. Now you see, I have labeled the cell wall with two lines there. Sometimes people will label on the outer and ask you, what is it? It is cell wall. Sometimes they will label in the middle and they'll ask you, what is it? 
It is also known as a cell wall. And now there is another line in between them. That is the plasma membrane. So remember, the entire piece is the cell wall. A cell wall is hard. It is rigid structure. It cannot be broken up easily. And that protects the cell, right? Okay, so I have one last question for you. How come the animal cell has so many organelles and the plant cell has so few organelles? How come? No, you see, all the organelles that you saw in the animal cell can also be found in the plant cell, except for a certain few. So if you take a look once again, you will not be able to find chloroplast, starch, the central vacuole, the tonoplast, and the cell wall. You will not be able to find these in an animal cell. Okay? The same way you will not be able to find vesicles, lysosomes, centrioles in a plant cell. You get it? Finally, the food storage. Plant cells store their food in the form of starch. Animal cells store their food in the form of glycogen. Pay attention to the differences, you will survive the lesson. Okay? Let's carry on. Dear students, listed before you is in words the function of each of the organelles that we have already seen before this. And I will bring to your attention whatever that is very important and make sure you remember those words for a long, long time now, okay? Let's go. The first one is the plasma membrane, which is the membrane on the cell surface that envelops the content of the cell. That means it separates the content of the cell from the outside environment, right? It is made up of proteins and phospholipids and is semi-permeable. Proteins and phospholipids, remember that they are the major component of the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is semi-permeable. The word semi-permeable means it shows selective permeability, which simply means some substance will be allowed to enter, some substance will be allowed to leave, but some substance will not be allowed to enter or leave. Okay, see, selective permeability. All right, next, let's Take a look at what are the substances that the plasma membrane controls. The substances are like respiratory gases such as carbon dioxide and oxygen, nutrients for example amino acids, glucose, and waste products such as carbon dioxide and urea in and out of the cell. The following organelle is the cell wall. The cell wall is found only in plant cells, so remember that it is only found in plant cells and it is made up of something called cellulose. Cellulose is a carbohydrate which is tough and fibrous, it's rigid and strong. The rigid layer that surrounds the plasma membrane gives shape and mechanical strength to support the plant. Therefore, without the cell wall, the plasma membrane would be able to burst if there is an influx of water. Now what prevents the cell from bursting? It is the cell wall. Very good. Next, the cell wall has tiny pores and is permeable to all fluids. Remember cell wall is completely permeable to all fluids in and out of the cell. Now once again, if people ask you what is the function of the cell wall, two words, protects and maintains the shape of the cell. Okay, protects and maintains the shape of the cell. End of story. Okay, next, let's take a look at the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is a jelly-like matrix found between the plasma membrane and the nucleus and where the organelles are suspended. So, to make it shorter, we can always say the cytoplasm is a jelly-like suspension. Why do we use the word suspension? Because the cell is a three-dimensional structure. The cell is like a watermelon, okay? And inside that watermelon, there is filled with that juices, the red-colored flesh, remember? Okay, it's filled with it. So what will happen is the plasma membrane will cover the entire cell and on the inside it will be filled with a lot of cytoplasm, a jelly-like fluid. Now this jelly-like fluid will hold all the organelles in place. Okay, good. Next, the cytoplasm contains organic and inorganic substances. What is organic substances? Organic substances are substances that contain carbon in them. Inorganic does not contain carbon in them. Example, water, H2O, no carbon, right? Inorganic substances. And it also acts as a medium for all biochemical reaction in the cell. Example of a biochemical reaction, respiration. 
So where does this process all go along? It happens in the cytoplasm. Most reactions happen in the cytoplasm. Next, we will take a look at an important structure, the nucleus. The nucleus is a large, dense and a spherical organelle which is closed by a nuclear membrane. We saw that earlier. It contains a nucleoplasm and a nucleolus which is dark and dense. Now nobody knows the function of the nucleolus for now. So in your level, you don't have to remember anything about the nucleolus other than there is something called nucleolus. Okay. Now what is more important is the chromatin. Good. Let's see. Chromatins carry genetic materials in the form of DNA. They control all cellular activity inside the cell. Let's take a look at the vacuole now. The vacuole is a fluid filled sac enclosed by a semi permeable membrane. Remember the name of the membrane still? Tonoplast, good. Next, inside that membrane or inside the vacuole, we find a fluid called the cell sap. Remember this word, eh? cell sap. The cell sap contains water, organic acids, sugars, which are also carbohydrates, okay? Amino acids, mineral salts, waste products, pigments, and metabolic byproducts. So the cell sap is made up of a big gooey substance. There is a lot of stuff in it which are kept as a storage purpose. What's the function? Storage. Good. Next. In herbaceous plants, the cell sap in the vacuole prevents the plant from wilting easily. Mature plant cells have large vacuole whereas young plants have smaller vacuole. You'll learn more about this when you go to form 5, okay? In some unicellular organisms, like the amoeba and paramecium, they have small vacuoles that, which act as food storage, which also helps to regulate the water balance. Now, especially in the paramecium, the guy needs to maintain his osmotic pressure. If he can't maintain, what will happen is, the water from the outside will enter into his body and will, allow, and will make him to explode or burst, which will cause him death. So in order to prevent this from happening, the paramecium has contractile vacuoles strategically placed on the top and the bottom. We will see in lesson 2, okay? These vacuoles will contract and allow water to be expelled and maintain his osmotic pressure. Next, the mitochondria can only be seen in electron microscope. They are small, spherical and cylindrical shaped organelles. They contain respiratory enzymes and is a site for cellular respiration. The key here is Mitochondria is a site for cellular respiration. Just remember that, okay? Food substances such as glucose are oxidized and energy is released in the form of ATP, which can be readily utilized by the cell. So people ask you the function of mitochondria? Simple. Carries out cell respiration, produces energy in the form of ATP. How does energy come? Cell respiration. Done. Ribosomes are compact spherical organelles and are either attached to the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum or suspended freely in the cytoplasm. Ribosomes contain two subunits, a large and a small subunit, each consisting of RNA. Now remember, DNA can be found in the nucleus, chromatins. RNA are found in other protein structures such as the ribosome. Very good. Next, ribosomes are site for protein synthesis. That's the key. Remember that protein synthesis. The endoplasmic reticulum next is a network of folded membranes which forms interconnected tubes. The endoplasmic reticulum membrane is continuous with the nuclear membrane which means the endoplasmic reticulum and the nucleus are attached. Okay, So whatever substance from the nucleus can move into the ER and some processes can be carried out. Okay, next. There are two types of endoplasmic reticulum, rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The rough endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes attached to the surface to synthesize proteins before transporting them in vesicles. So if I ask you the function of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, what will you say? Site for protein synthesis. Why? Because there are ribosomes attached to that. The moment the protein is synthesized, you've got to transport them out, right? So function of endoplasmic reticulum, rough, once again. Site for protein synthesis, transport proteins, done. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum doesn't have ribosome and it synthesizes lipids and detoxifies drugs and poisons and is also a site for metabolic reaction. So smooth endoplasmic reticulum will synthesize lipid. They also function for transport and a very important thing for objective question is that that the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is involved in detoxification of toxics. So whatever poison or drugs that you take and the cell is poisoned, the cell will be helped by the smooth ER. Okay, next. The Golgi apparatus 
is consists of a stack of a flattened membrane stack. It acts as a processing, packaging and transporting center for carbohydrates, proteins, glycoproteins and phospholipids. Now, what is the function of the Gaga apparatus? It acts as a yes, processing, modifying, packaging. Just remember any one of these three words. Processing, packaging, modifying. Any one of this you can use, okay? All right. Next. Transport vesicles from the rough ER will fuse with the membrane of the Golgi apparatus and empty its content into the Golgi apparatus. They are then processed and finished products are then repackaged in vesicles and are budded off from the Golgi apparatus. These budded vesicles will then fuse with the plasma membrane to release the contents out of the cell. Probably you don't get the picture yet. Now, this is what happens. See? From the rough endoplasmic reticulum, there are vesicles that travel away. From the rough, that is where the protein is being made. So the rough endoplasmic reticulum makes the protein and now what happens is, a vesicle will travel and attach to the Golgi apparatus. The moment it attaches to the Golgi apparatus, the contents which are found inside are emptied into the Golgi apparatus. Now what will the Golgi apparatus do? It will modify them, it will repackage them and it will send them out again. When they are sent out, they will travel towards the plasma membrane. And once they fuse with the plasma membrane, whatever enzymes which are inside will be released out of the cell. Now do you know how our pancreas produces enzymes that are used in the duodenum? Remember still from your nutrition days? Good. This is how it is being done. Next. Lysosomes, however, are small spherical sacs surrounded by a single membrane containing hydrolytic enzymes which will break down and digest complex molecules of food into simpler forms. Lysosomes also break down old and worn out mitochondria and organelles. Okay, function of lysosome? Contain hydrolytic enzyme involved in digestion of food. Enough. Okay, so these enzymes will hydrolyze. That means they will break up the bonds between the foods and will digest them. There is something known as autolysis. Now you see, this is a very incredible story of the cell. When the cell or any of its organelles end their life cycle or they reach a very old stage, they cannot function correctly anymore. What will happen is, the lysosome will rupture, allowing its enzymes to spill into the cytoplasm and digest everything in its path. This is the way the cell commits suicide. Ironic, isn't it? Let's carry on. In certain unicellular organisms, the lysosomes fuse with the food vacuoles to digest their contents and releasing the nutrients needed by the organism. These organisms are known as amoeba and paramecium. Centrioles, like I said earlier, are small cylindrical structures that are arranged in pairs outside the nucleus. The centrioles are composed of complex microtubules. Okay? They are found in only in animal cells and in cell division, they form spindle fiber. Function of centriole? Yes, involved in cell division. Finally, let's see the chloroplasts. They are a biconvex shaped organelle which has double membrane. They also contain green pigments known as chlorophyll. What does chlorophyll do? It captures the sunlight and converts it into chemical energy during photosynthesis. That is the formation of starch. Still remember why we found starch? Yes, because starch is the storage of food found in plant cells. So I believe we have come to the end of all the introduction that you needed about the cell and its organelles. Let's just have, uh, throughout the lesson, I had many questions that I asked you and I hope you answer a lot of those questions back correctly on time. Or not, you can go through this again and try to guess it before I give you the answers, all right? Now, let's just have one last question to see whether you really got everything in or not. Vacuoles are found in plant cells. Why then are vacuoles also found in some unicellular living organisms? Okay, students, the question is a very simple question. Vacuole found in plant cell. Why are vacuoles also found in unicellular organism? They did not ask you they are found in animal cell. A lot of students make that mistake. Now, what do you have to do? What are these unicellular organisms? Paramecium amoeba. Still remember when we were discussing about the paramecium? I was telling you about the contractile vacuole. Awesome, awesome. So now, why does the paramecium need the contractile vacuole? To maintain its osmotic pressure. So this would be your answer. Vacuoles found in unicellular organisms such as the paramecium 
help those unicellular organisms to move and maintain its osmotic pressure. So students, we are at the end of lesson one. I believe it was all fun for you. Now let's carry on to lesson two in the future. Thank you for viewing ITTV. Till we meet again in lesson two. Hope to meet you soon. Thank you.